the, the value, the sound values of dialects other than the one which they happen to speak. You know, of course, we all know there's only one way to speak Yiddish, which is my way. My, of course, is a highly changeable term depending on who happens to be speaking. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of experts. And in fact, there's nothing but experts. It's the only language that I know of in which I know less than anybody listening to me, uh, despite the fact that I'm the one who gets paid. It doesn't matter. It's you know, the old Ben Gurion joke. Uh, you know, is he had two and a half million bosses or something. Uh, it's similar to that. Everybody knows a lot about it. Uh, okay, are there any questions about what we've been talking about yesterday or anything else? Uh, vaguely relevant things that we might have touched upon here. Uh, yeah. Okay, in, in that case, we'll go on. What we were looking at yesterday had to do with isolated sounds. A particular vowel, uh, and it was only vowels and diphthongs that we were looking at. Uh, what I want to look at today, firstly, is the basic speech rhythm of Yiddish. I don't think I need to illustrate it all that much. I've actually been trying to inject as much of it into uh, my own speech in this session as is humanly possible, but I might have failed. I don't know. We're going to see there are a couple of important formative influences on this. And I have to say that in both of these cases, after a fairly early stage, the question of did these lead to Yiddish or did Yiddish lead to this becomes a kind of chicken and egg, or is it a chicken or egg question. You know, what you're dealing with after the first couple of generations is rather than a straight line kind of process, is a circle in which one thing plays off against the other so frequently and so, without, so seamlessly that it's really hard to say when you're speaking of individual people what might or might not have come first. Uh, the first thing, of course, and this is very important, this goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the week, one of the most important influences on Yiddish and the way it's spoken is something called Gimurani the tune of the Talmud. What Gemur Nigan is, is a particular way of intoning words that's used in traditional Talmudic study. Uh, anybody know what is the best single example, and they have any suspicion or idea, of Gemur Nigan that a regular person, that is a person who may not learn Gemora, but has some connection with Jewish life. Anybody know what this would be? Something that they would know. The and Seder. It's very common. Pardon me? It's the, the Seder. At the Seder, right. There's it's one of the tunes of Mash Manishtana. From Manishtana, exactly. So what happens is, you know, daddy comes home from shul, you say Kiddush, you say Halachma, uh, you fill the second cup somewhere. We used to have these fabulous Haggadahs, uh, somewhere from the General Israel Orphans Home, the Diskin Orphans Home. I think they came free with every tenth box of matzah or something. <laughs> the others definitely came free. They were from uh, Manischewitz. And they had these great pictures in the front of this family uh, celebrating the Seder. They were like line drawings of these people celebrating the Seder. So there's the bearded patriarch, and you go down the generations. But one of the sons, you know, and this thing I think was originally published sometime in the 20s, and they simply photo offset more copies every year. They never changed anything. One of the sons, he's like wearing a double-breasted suit. It's obviously, you could tell it was a blue suit, even though this was a uh, pencil drawing. And he's got a fedora and a pair of glasses, and he looks exactly like Clark Kent. <laughs> and every year my sister and I would Clark Kent, it's Clark Kent. And every year my father would lift up his patriarchal hand and let it land on my on my filial tuchus at about this point in the Seder. 
But after all of that has happened, after the father has ritually beaten the eldest son, <laughs> what the man of Shevetz Hagudah always describes as the youngest of the company, which always struck me as weird because in a traditional, in a from thing, it's the youngest son. Daughters didn't ask. The commandment is and you shall tell, and you can translate it, it's a perfectly valid translation to say your children or your child. But in a traditional environment, this, this meant uh, son. So it didn't matter how old my sister, you know, or the fact that I was older than my sister. I was the one that had to do it. And every day <coughs> came out the same way. And we used to still, we did it very old fashioned, we would fartach it. So you would do the whole deal just like you see in the Yiddish books, you know. Tata, ja, well, jetzt fragen vier kaches. And it's like my father is no fag, a hungry <laughs> asshole. <It's> like, <laughs> and you would start off in the Ashtakashi is Manishtona Lilo Azemi call Hallelois. You notice there's a particular cadence, my voice changed. And you would keep this even when you were fartachin. Farvus it does gonna have to pay sach and the next in a gans you wear. Every night of a whole year we eat uh, leaven and non-leaven. And then you fight each other. Notice the important stuff always stays in Hebrew. It's like, why don't you explain the parts that you're explaining? You know, words for night and hmm get translated, words for leavened and unleavened food stay in the original. So, you know, as we say, Chumet Samatz Alay Lo Jose, Not after that, and it doesn't come after Paisach, Kiloi Matzu, Esmir Nor Matzu, and it would go on uh, for three more questions, in fact. Notice the way it works. I remember the first day uh, I handed out a translation of the first page of the Gemara, and I, I said that, you know, in the original, uh, aside from the fact that it's in a completely different language and alphabet, the other thing you don't get is any sort of punctuation. <coughs> the words just run together. There's no way of knowing where some a given sentence stops or starts. There are no indications in the form of punctuation as to whether something is a question, whether something is an answer, whether something is meant to be taken seriously. The Gemara is full of smart-ass jokes. You know, there's a lot to be said about origins of Jewish humor in the Gemara. There's the famous phrase that anti-Semites have been quoting for hundreds of years. It says in the Gemara, money makes a bastard kosher. It doesn't mean money makes a bastard kosher. <laughs> it means money makes a bastard kosher. Or maybe it means Money makes or money makes a bastard kosher. <laughs> what it doesn't mean is that money can purify or kashrutify a bastard. In fact, it means the opposite. That you know, uh, mamzer, which in Jewish uh, Jewish laws is very specific. What a mamzer is, it's not merely. It does, it's not, in fact, the uh, you know somebody born out of wedlock that by itself is not, it's got nothing to do with Mamzerus in the strictly legal sense. It has to do with forbidden unions, incest, uh, a coin marrying somebody that he shouldn't in some cases. You know, there's a list of things. If you have, if I have a child with a woman who's married to another man at the time of the cohabitation, that child is a Mamzer. Not because we're not married to each other, but because she's married to somebody else. That's what counts. If I'm married to somebody else and she's single, it's not nice. It's not going to give the kid a lot of status, but it's not the kind of mamzerus that they talk about in, in Jewish law. So, you know, the more is full of these jokes. There are indications, there are certain words as you study in school, you learn that when you see this word or this phrase, this indicates that what's coming is X, Y, or Z. It often indicates the level of authority that the statement is to be granted. This, as I was saying, it very rarely says in the Gemara, here's the right answer. 
but you often can get from just the way it's phrased as to who said, uh, you know, the, the verb used for somebody or other said or spoke or piped up with an opinion, you often get a sense of, you know, how, how seriously you're supposed to take this, how authoritative the statement might or might not be. On the other hand, there are many, many cases in which none of these uh, signs is there.